Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second episode of Career Mode uh, by me, Diogo Cunha. I'm here with uh, uh, Francesco Nani. Uh, so much to tell about you. I can, I can say everything uh, that I want, all the good things. Uh, you've been a great friend, but I'll let that to you. So tell me, who are you as a coach, as a person? Who is Nani? <laughs> Uh, I'm a coach. Uh, no, I'm a, I'm a man that, that I happen to be a basketball coach uh, as my work. And I try to keep this distinction as clear as possible to myself, especially because I try to, you know, to blurry the line between job and, and personal life too much, as I'm sure a lot of other coaches do. And I'm very lucky. I've had great opportunities since I was very young. And I've tried to make the best out of them. And now at 27, right now, I'm the youngest assistant in our league uh, in the Italian uh, professional basketball. Um, so, yeah, that, that's basically it. I, I love basketball. I love to share. I love to learn a lot and to discuss with people about different views. Yeah, no, that's, that's for sure. Everyone recognized that on you, uh, I, would, I would say. Uh, probably the most trendy guy on Twitter now, as, as I was just saying uh, about preseason stuff. Uh, congrats for that. It's been like a lot, a lot of value. Um, but actually, like I will skip, uh, I'll skip what what I had here because it's true. You are the youngest. Only friending for today. What? What? Sorry, say again. Can you hear me? I'm trending only right now. It will disappear, you know. Twitter, oh, yeah, okay. As Andy Warhol said, like 15 minutes of fame for everybody. <laughs> yeah, everyone, everyone deserves it. But but I will skip what I was going to say. Like, you are the youngest assistant coach in the A2 league in Italy, very good league. So uh, I'll jump straight into that. Like, how did it start? What was the journey? And what are your, you know, your reviews or reflections from being in a, a professional environment from since so early? Uh, I, was, uh, I, was, I was coaching since I was 16 and then I became a head coach since I was like 18 of like very small kids, like a uh, 10 uh, year old, 12 year old. And when I got uh, 21, I was the assistant coach, the, the head coach of an under 15 guys team. And we reached the national finals in Italy, the you know, top eight, the team they were Amazing player, very coachable, very, very good. It was, they were not good because of mine. And after that, uh, in my hometown, a possibility opened up as an assistant coach, as a second assistant with my, with my club. And I was lucky enough that they called me. So this is a lucky break because I was really desperate after that season because the, the youth club where I reached that goal was disappearing. Goal. So it was, not, it was not an easy situation. Um, and I was lucky, and I, I, I tried to use that break, um, and I was super scared of like not being fired in my first season because I was I was never like a assistant coach at the like decent level before, not even with like under nineteen top level where like the head coach was telling me what to do. So I was it was the first time as an assistant coach in a professional league with like a very high demanding coach, and was like I was it was very hard for me in the beginning. And the thing that I discovered the most, I think that applies to the play right now is that I was forced to find ways to tell the player stuff. I was 23, I could not come in and like yell at somebody, hey, do this or do that. Uh, and I think this have led me to a different approach. You know, some, some, somebody will, would say more like, more positive coaching, more player centered in the way of how we give feedback, how we present feedback. And uh, it was more, oh, have you seen that? Like what you did over there was very interesting, but have you tried this or this idea of, you know, different ways of expressing myself with players, try to, you know, create a human connection before being ready to give any like real feedback. Sure. No. Wow. That's, that's, I imagine the, the, the scenario and the context of how, like being so young, eventually, I, I believe, coaching guys that were, were way older than you. Uh, and one, one interesting thing you're saying there is essentially being what you mean about being positive is also showing the players that you care and that you are there for them, for their development, for their, you know, 
for their performance basically right yeah yeah something that i've learned from this first coach is that, that it was incredibly hard worker uh, it was always in the gym and not always in the gym not in a you know in an overworking kind of way but it was always available for the player to pass them the ball to rebound for them to do one more exercise with them to stay after practice to talk to be there before practice like it was uh, this uh, care for the little details that made me understand uh, how much importance there is in everything that's not the two hours of session of practices of course yeah yeah no awesome and so jumping in, uh, now to to another topic that i remember since we we became friends uh, by the way do you remember that i think back in antwerp when we i don't know three years ago for you I, i don't know when it was but very very nice moments uh to be honest for me my perspective was i didn't have any clue what uh, the camp was going to look like and suddenly you know amazing coaches there i remember alex uh, uh being there two uh, um, guys from the state so it was really really incredible and uh, and yeah w- one of the topics we spoke since the beginning was was scouting because you, you of course uh, being a, a in a professional team that's that becomes a very important part of the job so How important do you think, like if you, if you reflect on that, how important is the scouting for the players approaching uh, games every week? Okay, so I'll try to, to answer a different question before. Uh, I think scouting is super important for a team uh, and for a coaching staff, first of all. Then we have to do a filter of what we want to transfer to the players. And it can be be different from game to game it can be different from level to level but also from moment of the season uh like for example now we are i already watch the first preseason games of our opponents in the preseason but we are not speaking about them with the team we are only like seeing okay they do a lot of this is an example a lot of off screen situation okay so it would be good to introduce our basic roster to be with us for all the season Maybe we introduce it uh, two or three practices before this friendly game so we can have a good test about it. Um, so this is just an example. Obviously, later in the season, the more the team becomes uh, clear and the more abilities they have sure. to master their basic abilities and their basic coverages, their basic coverage solutions and offense, the more you can change from game to game. But yeah. I think you need to be very careful as a coach. I don't know, like, tell me what you think, because I think very fine, thin line for a coach is between changing too much and every game, like changing and adjusting continuously and sticking to the plan too much. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, Does that make sense? Yeah, no, of course it makes. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I like your point. Uh, it's like when, when you go to, let's say we are in the playoffs, and of course the, there is much more scouting i believe uh, but at the same time you have even in the game i uh, uh, i guess head coaches and, and the, the coaching staff have to make a decision do we stick to the plan or do we change something because it's really not working so from what you're saying in the preseason you try to stick more with with your things before even trying to make you know you want to create that uh, um, foundation of your principles before trying to change something later in the season right Yeah, for sure. And in the preseason, for sure, like we're not changing anything. But uh, also during the season, I think something that we are very careful is when we try to change something, we are always looking at it and we try to have our players look at it through the lens of uh, adding a layer, adding a skill to our arsenal as a team. You know, we we are all born the video games generation, like an sure. uh, RPG, when you were leveling up and you like buy a new weapon or you add new skill, a new enchantment that you can make. And I think it's very similar for a team. You have to, to add the buy-in that, okay, now we are doing this uh, very aggressive switching defense and we're going to do it this game, but we're also going to keep it. And sometimes we're going to practice it because we're gonna, it's gonna become useful again during the season. And when we go on to revisit it, we are not gonna need to work on it uh, 
four times that specific week, but it's going to be something that we only need to recall and not build from scratch. Sure, sure. So, so then you'd say for, from, from a preseason point of view is trying to perhaps throw as many things as you can uh, to the players. So, of course, with, with terminology and as a concept within your identity, but then, so maybe it's not that useful in the beginning, but later on you can go back and, and pull something that, that you haven't been doing so much, right? Yes, I think, I think that's completely right. And you have found a better way to phrase it than what I've, than what I've said. <laughs> no, I like it. I think, I think the most important thing is um, that you can have different uh, sets. You can have a lot of sets in your playbook, but all the sets are a combination of basic actions, basic triggers, and your team need to be familiar and good at playing with, I don't know, like a side pick or roll with a full corner. They need to be good at playing that uh, with different, uh, again, different solution, drop, show, switch, uh, under, uh, push and under, whatever. Once they do that, the set is only a solution to get there to that situation, maybe with a specific advantage, maybe preventing a specific solution or maybe having force a defensive switch. So now uh, like um, the wrong guard is, is on our best pick a row player, that for example. So mm. I think if you don't have that uh, foundation of how to play different against different coverages, then set play becomes a sort of like trickery where you try to steal two points or you yeah. try to create a good shot, but it's not something that you recognize as yours as part of your dna as a team sure no makes makes sense and then another thing because i'm pretty sure i i i i believe you you probably didn't want this to be true but you probably weren't always in a winning team you know we all will always have some some not so good uh, seasons how is it yeah. to incorporate or, or what ways you try to incorporate the video and the scouting and watching the opponents of course probably highlighting how what they do well or what we have to try to prevent and how do you do that while trying to empower your players to be confident to be uh, yeah confident sorry con uh, confident approaching the game okay so first of all uh, i will tell you something that is one of the most important things that i've learned uh, since being with a professional team i've, I've never realized that um, is that the the professional season it can be very boring for a team, for the players. While when you coach young players, you never realize that. And it's not true for them because they go to school and coming to basketball is something they do three, maybe four or even five times a week, but it's their, their fun. For this player, it's their work. It's obviously like a privilege to, have, uh, to do this as a job, but it's a routine that goes on the same way for a long period of time. So you need to find ways to break the routine and to have difference difference in your week. So I we have a a, a simple set of uh, let's say a schedule for the video. Usually we do like on on Thursday we see the first thing about our opponents. On Friday we see something else more specific about their offense. And on Saturday we watch the individual skills video, and that that can be it. And on Sunday maybe the game plan. But we try to change it very often to differentiate from game to game and also the kind of message that we sent obviously like we don't need to be foolish let's say that we are a, a top team in the league and we play like um, against the last team in the league the last team standing we cannot go there and you know say the usual routine oh they are a great team blah 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 like we need to find ways for our players to respect them and the best way that i've seen with smart and competent player to simply tell them, you know, maybe we are better than them, but we need to prove it on the court. And this is how they can beat us. This is how they want to play the game, for example. I don't know, they want to play up tempo or they want to uh, let us uh, set up for the mid range jumper on the pick and roll. And this is what we need to do in order to win. Obviously, 
when you are the last team in the league and you play against the top team in the league, you try to be more positive in your messaging. You try to be more, you know, tease. and also, you know, the, the editing of the video that you're going to do, like uh, you're going to show clips of them being put in trouble by other teams, maybe similar mm -hmm. as yourself. So maybe not great teams that have put them in trouble with a specific defense or with a specific offense or by, I don't know, passing mm -hmm. the ball. Like you're going to find things that you want to incorporate in your game plan and put them in the video. So I think it's a completely different messaging if you do it for uh, yeah, yeah. depending on the, of the moment of the season. Sure, no, and, and it resonates with me that you, again, uh, I, I believe uh, referring to, to Mike McKay, but you have to know who you are coaching and, and, and w that differs on the message that you share with them, right? So again, not, and sometimes it's not even what players you are coaching, but also what's the context of the team, because you can have the same players in one season having a very good season on top of the league or, or perhaps next, next season, not, not so much. So that's, that really makes sense. And then just to finish on the scouting topic, uh, what's, what's your role or, or what's, what are your, your, your preferences, the way you like to work or, or the way you have seen more efficient to, to, to help the process between the film and the on-court on work? So there is, of course, a difference. There is, you, you have to prepare the game in, in the video room, but also uh, in the court. So how, how do you like to do it? So uh, first of all, we need we like to say that uh, everything we show on the video need to be practiced on the court. We are not, I know that uh, like NBA teams are more expert in that. They are more uh, trained player in this regard that they can only prepare a game by watching things on a video. We we don't have the ability to do that, and also we don't have the necessity to train our players to do that because it, we we often have a week to prepare or maybe three days, but we have some practices in between. So what we like to do is, um, it can depend, like sometimes we can start introducing a concept on the floor, for example, we can start on Tuesday, the first day of the week, work, working on, uh, I don't know, how to attack hard shows on pick and roll without even telling them that it's their defense on Sunday. And then on Wednesday, we go in the video room and say, okay, they try to play our, our show, our edge as much as possible. So this is what we want to do. This is our coverage solutions for the day and blah, blah, blah. And uh, it can be the opposite. It can be that we start maybe on, on Wednesday in the video room and we show them that they like want to play up tempo and run every time they can. And we're going to do some stuff about the importance of um, defensive transition and whatever your system is for offensive rebound and defensive transition. And also for most specific set, you know, if they run, I don't know, horns up and it's this set and we want to do this specific scram switch or something, uh, we, we do everything on the court as well. We cannot, uh, we don't want to see something only in the video. Does sure. it make sense for your experience? No, for sure. I mean, yes, again, as okay. you said, no, no necessity to do that, I guess. And, and at the same time, uh, it you have to to translate what's what's going in the video and especially like I can translate that to working with with young guys with youth uh, players watching the video first of all they are not so used to it and I'm sure in your previous youth experiences you have felt the same and you have to make it very easy and very translatable what we what you've seen and the cues you've seen to then on the court what it looks like because it's it's really not the same uh, if we put yeah. ourselves in the player's perspective. Uh, moving, moving on to, to the youth, because, or, or, I mean, of course you can do it uh, uh, with professionals, I guess, but the, when we start uh, speaking, and, and I believe in, in Antwerp, we connected very well because you, you are really a master of trying to create uh, small-sided games. Uh, and the, 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 interesting yeah. thing, <laughs> the interesting thing is that, uh, well, I'll, I'll say something a little bit risky, but most small-sided games, uh, at least usually you start with, with an advantage. And so you teach the players how to maintain spacing, how to uh, uh, maintain the advantage. And you actually try to create, or at least I've seen some stuff uh, from you, that you are actually teaching them how to maintain. So when you get to that neutral situation, 
what do we do? How do we move from here? So I don't know, do, do you want to maybe review your thought process when creating drills and situations? Oh, that, that's a very uh, theoretical and hard question. So <laughs> what I think is that uh, for my, like, okay, let's start with this. I agree with what you're saying. I have had teams in the past when I was coaching that were very good at uh, maintaining the advantage and they were not very good at creating it. We were uh, counting on individual talent to create the advantage, individual one-on-one -on -one skills to create the advantage every time. And after that, we were good at maintaining it. Like I've done a lot of drills, you know, four on three plus one that recovers in many different ways, blah, blah, blah. Right spacing, right timing, right reaction, uh, cutting. And that my team used to be very good at it, uh, but we were not good at creating it. When we were finding a team, for example, that double was uh, up court, full time, great pressure, we were great. Passing, passing. But sometimes when we play against a team that were sagging off a little bit more and playing more competitive defense and stunting and not giving us clear advantages, we were kind of lost. And so what I've tried to do in the last couple of seasons is to focus more, first of all, in the difference between when there is an advantage, even more or less like a closeout situation when the defense is a little bit off balance and I can attack it, when there is not an advantage. And so uh, I have to create it. And the idea of how to create it can, can be different. So for somebody it can be like, uh, you have a specific trigger that you go, you go into a, blow, a ball screen or like, I don't know, like you run transitions, there's not an advantage and immediately, the ball goes back to the point card and it calls a set. That can be, it can be one mm -hmm. example of a trigger or something that you mm -hmm. can do. But uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, allow players some freedom in the picking of their of their trigger. And uh, with this freedom, we want them to make them think about who they are and where they playing with. So let's say that I receive the ball on the wing and it's a neutral situation. The pass was not great. I have to cut it in midair and land and the defender is neutral in front of me. And now we have to do something. And I have to know that, okay, I'm let's say a big, you know, like a stretch four, but not a creator of dribble, sure. not a picker or player. Uh, I can maybe go for a dribble end off with the teammate in the corner or the teammate on top, and I have to see who, who is the better player. Uh, one more advanced route can be okay. Maybe Diogo is not a ball handler, but he's a great shooter, so I would like play a dribble and off with him. And in the opposite corner, the, my other friend is uh, a great uh, ball handler, so I can pass the ball to him and go and set a screen. And it will take advantage from that because it's a great ball ender. Maybe can reject the screen. Maybe can set it up in a better way than with a dribble and off. Sure. This yeah. is no, that's... some of the example. And with that freedom, you can introduce two-man action or also three-man action. Like, uh, like the one that you, you saw yesterday. Like you can pass the ball to somebody and go screen somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so so the, in, in that beginning, uh, I, I guess... So in the beginning of that process, you give the freedom to the players to try the different actions that they could choose if, if you are in a neutral situation. But then later on, maybe you make them think. I, I believe you're very good at that as well as, you know, making the players find maybe or, or in influencing them to where you want. And, and so, of course, if you have, uh, um, if you are playing next to, um, let's say, a stretch uh, or, or just, uh, uh, traditional four, let's say, you pass the ball and then it doesn't make so much sense to go and set the pin down for that four because is you won't be able to create off of it. Yeah. So then you try to influence them, right? Yeah, I think uh, you made them think. And in the beginning, the, the, fun, the foundation of this should be that they are all able to know the different reads uh, for a reaction, like you play a dribble and you can have this freedom uh, once you have a basic understanding of how to play a dribble and off, how to play a ball screen. Like for example, if I would have to coach like a younger team, I would not introduce like ball screen, get, dribble and off. I would maybe start only with a get or only with a dribble and off because I think uh, it's very hard and it's very hard, but it's doable to learn how to play with read, reading the defender, reading different differences, reading the help of the other two players involved. 
And if I introduce three actions at the same time that are similar and some actions are similar, like some reactions, if they go under, if they do something else, it's similar, but it's not the same. So I think it's better to introduce one and then the other and then the other. Of course, yeah. And so then that... add the players. Yeah, go on. No, 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 go, go, go ahead. Sorry, we have a little delay here, but no. Like, <laughs> what, what do you think? What do you think is the easiest action to teach, like under fourteen or fifteen? I don't know. I, I had many debates about that. Not only what is easier, but but what makes more sense for their development. Uh, I, for example, if you try to to teach off ball screens, that might be a little bit more easy. I won't say easier on the read, but it's it's less complex on on than, than a, a, a ball screen, for example. I, I would say, but at the same time, it's you need a passer. So then you have one more factor that could make it harder for them so there are many many uh, factors there uh, to be honest i've been a fan of of um get actions because you can easily like from that foundation of the get action you can easily uh, try to teach either more ball screen approach to the get action or the dribble end off if that makes sense in terms of the teaching and what the players need to know so i don't know does that make sense for you okay what would be your no, answer? It, it makes question? total sense. Like, uh, I'm, I'm honestly conflicted still about dribble and off and get because I think get are an easier way to do two things, most important to involve young big men that are not able to uh, play one on one of the dribble. I think play the get action is a great way for them to be able to be useful in the game as a passer, as a decision maker. And I think that's incredibly important. We need to retain those kids in basketball for as much as possible. And obviously during the practice, they will try to learn everything else. But like, sometimes you are lucky enough, uh, somebody can be lucky enough to have like very tall player. I had one kid, 14 year old, he was 198. And he was not able to play one-on-one. It was very uncoordinated. He started playing basketball since like yeah. one year before but we and it was still growing so we wanted to have him do stuff but he was not able to one-on-one -on -one of the dribble with players that were like 185 in front of him so we were using the get action at the same time i think that the dribble and off can be a very effective tool when you're neutral or when the drive is not effective to you know flow into a dribble and off or a pitch where your teammate attacks so i think i would start with the gets uh but later the dribble and off is a good way to to not let the ball stagnate in one yeah. place if you need to like drive pitch and somebody else is driving for, for sure no that's that that makes a lot of sense and and one the way i like to approach at least the youth is you know tactically when you work with pros your goal is to win the next game but from a youth perspective uh, at least the way i like to think it is whatever we do tactically uh, is of course to help them to get to to higher levels, but at the same time, is the 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 instruments or or the foundations on how they can keep developing their skills. Uh, because so, for example, if we are just to give one example, as as what you said, if we are playing with get action, so we want to involve more big guys into the decision making with ball, because yeah. that's really where we believe they will need to be good at in the future. Not necessarily to win the game, so there is not that. The necessity is more the, yeah. the the construction on on how to develop those those skills. But you you talked about something very interesting, uh, uh, the flow of the game and the differences between actions. And so, for you, is is a team? I, I must admit, for me, watching any level, but teams that can quickly go from neutral situation into flow uh, to the next action, for me, that's that's lovely to see. If even though. Maybe they don't uh, uh, cannot create the advantage or maintain it so well, but those teams that flow easily for me is is amazing to watch. Do you consider that you know the best teams are the ones that can flow uh, efficiently from one to the other? Uh, I'm gonna give a very political answer. <laughs> I think teams can be so free, yeah. uh, very, very, very good in different ways. I've seen teams that are not good at all at flowing from one action to the other but uh, are good at uh, creating advantage uh, because they have 
many one-on-one -on -one good player. And maybe as a defense, you're able to, you know, to stop the dominoes different times during the action because they themselves are not very good at like playing 0 0.5 decision. But it's, uh, you know, relentless uh, effort to play defense against them because even when they stop the ball, they can attack again and again and again. So it's very hard. It could be very hard to play against that type of team. Obviously, to have that, you need to be super, to have many different talented players one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, or you can be a very good team. Uh, I think this is some, sometimes underrated in our uh, basketball uh, Twitter world sphere where we are all very theoretical. But something that we underrate is the pace of the action. Like sometimes you see a team playing like uh, Euro transition, like uh, cut, replace, rebound off, side pick a roll, swing, swing, it, and they swing it five times. And maybe their reads are not perfect because they are not uh, attacking every screen, reading every step. Oh, maybe here the defender was cutting the screen or maybe he was there. They force you to play defense for 20 seconds with the ball five times. And in the end, it's very hard to not do a mistake against them. It's something that it's not my view of basketball. I don't like to teach, oh, move the ball very fast until the defense make a mistake. But mm -hmm. I think there is a value in that. And sure. some teams are good in that way. What I'm trying to say basically is only that you can be good in different ways. Uh, it's the same that you can be good like playing fast or playing slow. You can be good uh, with different ways of, uh, let's say, reading the advantage and the neutral sure. situation. Um, and also, the, like meaning, uh, I would say, meaning that not every advantage, so uh, an advantage for your team might be different from my team so maybe you have to you want to stop your set play or your actions if you find like a, if you have a no stage dribble going to the basket but maybe i'm just again just a stupid example but maybe for my team that's not enough to stop whatever we were doing and so we want yeah. to, to to find something else uh yeah at least that i make you make a clear example i think i think what you said is great so for my team let's say that there is a drag situation with classical spacing with the other big man in the opposite guard position. And um, there is a little bit of a stunt and you can either like have that big space, pass him the ball, nothing happened on the first side, you're gonna play the second side. Or you can ask him to cut. Yeah. Uh, if he cut, maybe he's gonna be open for a basket. And maybe if he's not gonna be open for a basket, you're gonna have uh, ruined your uh, flow to the second side. You know sure. what I mean? Like you sure. cannot have the continuity anymore to pass the ball to somebody and go for a second and off or something. So that is a decision that you make as a coach. When And it obviously it's not black and white, but when it's better to cut uh, or when it's better to stay, maybe you're going to keep the open shoot, uh, keep the open three, or maybe you're going to keep the ball and be there as a solution for the team to continue to flow into the next action. Of course, yeah, yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense, and it's probably you know the philosophical questions of the of the head coaches of trying to figure yeah. out what's what's the best way to to approach it, and again, it depends a lot on, on the personnel too. Uh, but I mean, I do, I really want to keep this this short. I really appreciate your time, and it's been I think it's been great. Uh, uh, a lot of good yeah. points here. I, I'll, I'll wait for the feedback of anyone listening, at least. Uh, uh, I hope someone someone will listen. But uh, just last question here on the podcast. I really wanted to 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 dive into this because it's called career mode. So there is a, a you know an approach to 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 how we see basketball uh, uh, in different ways and how basketball can bring us different things. And you are a really nice example of of this. So. What is something that you've taken from other countries or cultures? You can take this from basketball perspective or life perspective, doesn't matter. I know you've been, of course, in Antwerp with me uh, uh, three years ago in Czech Republic this, this summer was, I believe it was great, your time there at least, uh, I was yeah. jealous. So tell me, what's, what is something you've taken? Uh, okay, so... Uh... I've read a great piece yesterday, a great article, and it's not about basketball, but it said that uh, we need sometimes to rethink the idea of a career and not meaning uh, like working for a living. Sure. But uh, I don't like the idea of working and sacrificing uh, 15 years of my life doing a work that I don't like 
because maybe one day I will get the work that I like. Does it make sense? Like if I want to be a head coach, if I would say, no, I don't like being an assistant coach. I don't like to, to do the scouting. I like to do the video. I don't like to uh, obey to somebody else. And in the end, like the, the final decision are not mine. I'm the head coaches. Uh, I don't think I would like to spend my life doing something because maybe one day I will get another opportunity. Sure. Uh, I, five years ago, two years ago, I would answer, I would have answered differently. Now I'm very uh, convinced of this. But obviously, it's not always black and white. This is something that I'm saying all the time. Like it's not the dream job, uh, but I like being an assistant right now. I think I have a lot to learn, and I want to do it with uh, as best coach as possible. I'm very lucky this year with uh, I come here with the coaches that with a coach that I know, and he called me, and I'm super lucky and happy to be here. Uh, but I don't think, like, obviously you're going to pick maybe one job that is a great opportunity and that is maybe uh, not perfect, but it's great for connections and stuff. I don't think coaches, young person in general, should spend 10 years uh, being continuously underpaid. And this, I know it's a huge job basketball community because it seems that to work for nothing, you don't like basketball enough. Like, it's not true. I will do to coach for free, I can coach whatever I want. I can go maybe somewhere else and coach for free. Yeah, yeah. I, like, uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of like uh, right of labors and right of workers. And I think uh, we should try to avoid that. If it's something that doesn't make you happy, you should not try to sacrifice 15 years of your life. Because maybe in the end, you won't be happy even with, if you get the position that you think you want it. Does it make sense? Did I explain that correctly? No, I, I mean, uh, at least I understand that completely. It's a, it's a great topic, and I think you touched there on a very important uh, point of, of how much, and especially now, it, it makes a lot of sense in this podcast because it's really career mode. So I'm, I'm here sharing my, uh, like, the way I've grown and, and what basketball has shared with me, and there's different ways of doing it, and definitely uh you know it's it's a problem because we have to do so much usually or i would say 90 percent of the coaches yeah. especially that are not former players you have to do so much of something underpaid and their value especially that it, it seems like the ladder is very uh, uh deep or steep i don't know what, what's the word so that makes a lot of sense for me and also no, but, uh, you know enjoying the process you you don't want to spend time and then Looking back and yeah, exactly. it was I want I want I... to clarify something because because otherwise the basketball Twitter community is gonna is gonna kill me. <laughs> I'm not saying that you should not uh, have a hard work and maybe underpaid for some years. Uh, I think it's normal. I've done it. Everybody has done it. But what I think is that uh, if you get at a point where you don't like it anymore, where you're doing something that you don't like only because you you think is necessary for the next step. That is the point where I would suggest you, as a personal suggestion, to step out maybe and do something slightly different. Uh, like I've done, like if tomorrow Hector Messina called me, hey, Francesco, come here, be the 10th assistant in a EuroLeague team and do it for free, I would do it. I would do it right now because I think it would be a great opportunity for me. I would learn a lot and I would have fun doing it. Obviously, there would be hard working and stuff, but it's something that I would like to do. You know, I, I think this explained the difference a little, a little bit better than what I've said before. No, no, but it, and and uh, I still believe it, it makes sense. You have to, of course, you, there are sacrifices you have to do, but also making sure that there is a balance within that because sometimes we it could lo look like a, a trap and, and you cannot get out of this. And especially in basketball, like elite sports for sure, but basketball specific, specifically here in Europe, it's great. We have a good fan base, but it's not, there are not many countries where basketball is the top sport, uh, you know, maybe Lithuania and not much, not much else. So so for me, I think that that really resonates and, and thanks for the clarification. Uh, so, Nani, <laughs> uh, thanks a lot yeah. for your time. Really looking forward to see your your season, to see how it goes. Wish you the best. I, I've seen Thank you, incredible yeah. views over there, uh, close to yeah. to the coast. So I'm I'm jealous now in Germany. Yeah. Uh, but but really good luck. I hope we can uh, keep in touch and uh, anything. I hope you are uh, a fan of the podcast. Whenever this. Uh, gets out yeah. to the world. <laughs> I, I will. I will listen it for sure, man. It's been a pleasure. Bye, bye. Right. Thank you. Bye.